Hello, and welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And this is Mark Florence. And today we're talking about The Thing. Mark, today as we are recording this, it is June 25th, 2020, and on this date in history in 1982, The Thing was released. I wasn't even born yet. That. Wow, you're so young. You're such a baby. <laughs> it's true. It's a young buck. I don't, yeah, so I've never seen this movie before. Mark has never seen this movie. He didn't even know about this movie. But also, P.S., if you have not realized, we are on a John Carpenter, like, roller coaster. I don't know what what that's all about. Like, every movie you suggest, I don't even know what it is. And then... You hear the uh, music at the beginning and you're like, okay, this is John Carpenter. So I, I have to tell you this, Mark. This movie was released at the same time as E.T. And this doesn't mean anything to you because apparently you weren't born yet. But E.T. was like the biggest thing since sliced bread. And the thing bombed at the box office. I am familiar with the movie E.T. Um, that's So they came out at the exact same time frame? Yes. And people rejected this movie um, at the time. So it was, it uh, was, had a budget of 15 million, but it only made 19 million at the box office, which it, it was considered a failure. But guess what? In retrospect, it is now 84% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. And it is considered a sci-fi slash horror classic. But at the time, people rejected it. But E.T. is like an all-time classic. So I don't even know why we're comparing these two fine films. Because they came out on the same weekend in the same year. (laughs) Fair, Fair enough. So this movie is based on John Campbell's novella, who goes there and it has, you know, it didn't have this huge budget, just like ET. It uses a lot of practical effects, which PS like give me practical, practical effects any day of the week. Right. At the beginning, they used some quote unquote CGI. Like, I don't even know what you want to call it. Some like computer graphic stuff. For an alien ship coming in, and that was not very well done. But yeah, I was very impressed throughout the throughout the movie with the you know the different shapes the thing took and all the different effects. But they were all practical, like I don't even know, like the stop motion or whatever you want to call it. But they weren't like CGI. And at this point in time, obviously in 1982, you needed to have those practical effects of like masks and like actual fluids like erupting from a you know a thing like a a physical thing versus trying to like animate it with a computer because no it probably wouldn't have worked out as well they totally made the right decision by doing what they did and like i'm sure it took like a, a lot of time and effort and all that but yeah a lot better but now now you just go cgi Yeah, true. But you know what? I think we're making a return to practical effects, to tell you the truth. Can I talk about a couple of actors who are in this movie? Well, obviously, Kurt Russell's in it. And, you know, we know that um, John Carpenter loves him. But also, the old man, I can't, I don't remember his character name, but the old man in this movie is Steve Martin's dad in House Sitter. And that is one of my guilty pleasure movies of all time. That house sitter movie with Goldie Hawn and Steve Martin. The old man in this movie is Steve Martin's dad, and I love it. I, I'm sure I've seen that movie. I don't remember it. I'm literally going to make you watch it tomorrow. Oh, no, I got something to do tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I'm, I love it so much. And also, um, it's Wilford Brimley Sands mustache. That was weird. Like. It took about, I don't know, a third of the movie before we were like, is that Wilford Brimley? Because he didn't have his, 
classical mustache that he always has. So, like, didn't even recognize the guy. Now, Mark, I was like, what do you recognize Wolford Brimley from? And you're like, isn't he in that movie where, like, old people become young? And I'm like, yeah, he's in Cocoon. Did you ever see Cocoon? I plead the fifth. Wait, Mark, tell me. I don't think so. I don't know. Oh, my God. Okay, guess what? We have a double feature tomorrow night. (laughs) Yeah, I really, uh, you know, I gotta, I gotta be somewhere tomorrow. He really stepped in it, you guys. <laughs> I'm literally gonna make him watch House Sitter and Cocoon tomorrow. Like, wow. But I do remember Wilford Brimley from uh, Seinfeld, where he played the Postmaster General when Kramer said he didn't need mail anymore, and then he had to m- meet. With- <laughs> He got like kidnapped by the the post office, and he had to meet with the postmaster general, Wilford Brimley. It was, it was a good scene. Okay, yeah, he he's iconic. P.S. Obviously, now this movie starts with this helicopter chasing this husky in the supposed Antarctic, you know, wilderness through the snow, and I'm like, oh, I was I was so feeling for this husky and i was like oh no mark no like what is happening but of course i've seen this movie before and i remember actually that that dog is problematic because it is quote unquote the thing um the norwegian helicopter is shooting at it and it ends up hitting one of the men at this post and um you know the the husky doesn't get hit but there's some problems happening and you know they're uh trying to attack this outpost and things go down so yeah i was gonna ask you about that them trying to hunt the wolf or dog scene like you obviously hated it but now that you know it's the the thing like how do you feel about it well obviously i in retrospect i'm like well i wish they had shot it but if they had, there'd be no plot and there'd be no movie. So I get it. It's such a perfect setup, though, because you're like, wait, why are you doing this to this poor innocent creature? But uh, guess what? It's not. That was a very interesting way to open it up and like kind of confuse the audience. Like, what's going on? Why is why is a Norwegian helicopter shooting at a, wolf, or a dog? And then the guy gets out. He starts kind of shooting the people and they kill him. So, yeah, I was, I was, uh, you know, I didn't know what was going on for a while. And also, um, Kurt Russell, when he's introduced, because he's, you know, obviously our, our main guy here, he isn't necessarily likable because he's getting himself drunk. He's wearing like a sombrero or something as he's riding around in his helicopter. Like, what's going on, dude? You, you do not seem trustworthy. In the first scene, they show him and he's playing that chess wizard oh, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to, I used to have that on my computer, my PC as a kid. So uh, it's kind of cool to see that again. And he literally he loses to the computer, and instead of like taking it like a man, he <laughs> calls the computer the B word <laughs> and pours his drink into the computer and it like sparks. Like Mark, did you ever do that? I never did that. Um. My dad literally had a cover, uh, like a dust cover that he put on the computer every night. So I think me and my dad would lock the computer. He had like a key where you could like lock the computer. But that's a whole other story. But um, no, so yeah, we were we were we were very nice to our computer. Um. So speaking of uh, actors who are in this movie, we were talking about a couple of um, heavy hitters. We just talked about They Live last week, and the actor, the co-star from They Live is in this movie, like uh, John Carpenter again. John Carpenter likes his actors. Like, like Kurt Russell looked a lot like Snake Plissken in this film, I thought. Without the eye patch, basically. Without the eye patch. Ironically, for something unrelated to this... This week at work, I had to Google, I didn't have to Google, but I Googled Captain Ron for some reason. And their first picture that pops up is Kurt Russell, long hair, beard with an eye patch, looks just like Snake Plissken. 
Oh my goodness. Okay, wait. <laughs> Remind me about the Captain Ron plot. I don't I, know that if I've seen that movie. Uh, wait, do we have a triple feature tomorrow uh, night? <laughs> oh my god. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to watch Captain Ron as well. Apparently. Oh no. Yeah, I don't remember. They, it's like a family goes on vacation and Kurt Russell's their captain, Captain Ron. And he's like a fun loving like party guy and he I'm guessing he like fixes all their problems. I don't know. <laughs> oh boy. I, I mean I guess we'll find out. Now, do you remember how I said this movie flopped um when it came out opening weekend versus E. T. I yes, that was a few minutes ago, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm just asking. <laughs> so guess what? John Carpenter was lined up to direct Drew Barrymore, who, from E.T. fame, was to star in Stephen King's Firestarter. He was lined up to direct that. And guess what? After this movie, The Thing came out, John Carpenter was fired from that gig. That's very short-sighted. I don't like that at all. Like... Honestly, like, what are the, I mean, what are the chances? And also, like, Firestarter, I mean, in its own right, like, became whatever it became. But they didn't trust John Carpenter because of the thing. And P.S., it is obviously, like, a horror slash sci-fi classic in retrospect. But at the time, it was rejected. So, who directed Firestarter, and then how did that movie do? Well, Mark, I don't have those. I don't have those um, those stats available. So you need to look it up right now, and I will literally wait for you <laughs> to look it up, and I'll edit it in because I only know <laughs> the John Carpenter facts, not the. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I don't know the actual results of those facts. So here we go, Mark. School us. 1984 Firestarter or? Yeah, yeah. Two, or no. 2002 Rekindling. No, obviously. <laughs> no. Okay. Tell us who directed it and what's its percentage and all that business. It was directed by Mark L. Oh, Mark L. Lester. Mark Lester. Okay. <laughs> it is. 35% fresh on Ooh. tomatoes. It's 6.1 out of 10 on IMDb. And... Well, tell us what else he directed. This guy. Could you tell us? I'm trying to find the stats and how much it made and all that. Reception. Not great. Not great at all. Ooh, it made... Uh... 17.1 with a budget of 12 million. So it made 5 million. Th- very similar to this movie. Yeah, not not great in in retrospect. So, getting back to the thing, this alien being can replicate any being on earth and they say within 127 thousand hours or something 27,000 oh sorry 27,000 hours which is equivalent to three years it could take over humanity yeah I actually you know I thought it was kind of similar obviously not the same to the COVID stuff we have going on right now where you hear these stats these big you know projections and stuff so yeah it kind of kind of felt real in that regard You know, a couple of cool scenes, speaking of practical effects, going back to that, they show these bodies, like, bleeding out. And at first we were like, what's up with this? Like, their blood is dripping down and it turned into ice. But we were thinking, like, okay, if it's cold enough, just like water dripping down or any other liquid your blood would turn into an icicle. Like, wow, that is freaky and fascinating. And, you know, they're they're saying um, it's 40 below at one point and it's going to become 100 below. 
And uh, we've we've experienced 40 below, 100 below, no. But, you know, northern Minnesota, we've we've dealt with it all. That's why I disagreed with some of the uh, wardrobe choices that Kurt, Kurt Russell made. Uh, a lot of times he's just outside without a hat on. It's 40 below, it's whatever, 50, 60 below. And he's just not wearing a hat. Your ears will get really cold. That would suck. And then when he was, he didn't ever, well, he wore a sombrero, but he, he was just putting his hood up. Like, I don't think that would have done much. So as a person who lives in Antarctica or whatever, he he, he didn't really know what to wear when it got cold. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if we're nitpicking, probably, but at the same time, you need to see who your actors are and, you know, how they're emoting. That's true. No, I thought the the thing, a lot of different times they showed it and it looked different, you know, going from person to person or thing to creature to creature, but we thought it looked like a lot like the Demogorgon from Stranger Things. Yes, and I think that Stranger Things was inspired by this movie. I think part of it, part of the Demogorgon was inspired by this. And also, um, the X-Files episode called Ice was absolutely 100% derived from this movie. And so, great horror slash sci-fi television streaming episodes have come from this movie it's a classic and then another theme from some of the movies we've been watching recently is like islands like a lot of these movies take place on islands and i, I you know i guess antarctica technically is an island but it's more of a just very you're very isolated and you're like you can't go anywhere. Like you, there's nowhere to run. There's no buddy to help you. You're on your own. You know, you have to deal with the situation within like the confines of like your environment, your current environment. So I thought that was kind of interesting. No, it's the absolute truth. And I think great horror has been derived from this exact experience you know like how many movies literally in the past three months have we talked about this it's almost all of them and then we, yeah and we were saying this one too even felt like a like a classic murder mystery type thing where you're like staying you know all these people are like staying overnight at like a mansion or something because you knew somebody was like turned or bad or like the thing but you just didn't know who, quite know who it was, and people thought it was the Kurt Russell character, and, you know, a lot of stuff was going on, and, like, there was, like, lots of paranoia and, like, backstabbing and, like, little scuffles between people, so, um, yeah, I just never quite knew who you could trust. And now, to bring this into a, a topical thing that just happened in NASCAR, there was a like a noose hanging out in a shed. This hap this happened in NASCAR recently, so I thought just to tie it to the current current thing here. Yeah, so they put Wilford Brimley out because they didn't know if they could trust him because he literally was the first person to come on to this idea that uh the chance of anyone else being infected by the the thing was seventy five percent. And he was so he was freaking out. And so they're like, oh, guess what? You're freaking out. So we're going to lock you up in this place. But at one point, Kurt Russell comes to talk to him and we see a noose. And, you know, literally today, as we were looking at Twitter, we saw NASCAR release the photo of um, the garage pull, quote unquote, and it absolutely looked like a noose. And, you know, for Bubba Watson um, to experience that and um you know for nascar to back him and push his car like that was you know this historic moment in history definitely yeah and that you know that was not a normal garage pull thing so i don't yes. know i don't know what was going on there but 
that's just, I don't know. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, I don't think it was okay, truthfully. It seemed, you know, not okay. Yeah, so yeah, it was just weird to to see that in this movie. So, apparently, right underneath everybody's nose, Wilford Brimley is making a spaceship in an ice cave with, like, spare materials he's been collecting. (laughs) So, how did nobody know about this? Well, I don't know, but it's a great (laughs) plot point because, you know, they need to go down there and find it. And guess what? flamethrowers are a huge point in this movie and yeah flamethrower it yeah like fire versus ice yes a lot of like every most deaths or weapons in this movie had to do with fire there's flamethrowers dynamite a lot of like pouring over gas to like kill stuff so yeah it was all about burning versus cold heat versus cold even ended that way with with uh, Kurt Russell and the other actor I can't remember his name now sitting there Keith David Keith David playing the waiting game just saying just, you know I think maybe each one thought the other one had turned and they were just going to sit sit out there and wait so and then the movie just ended so we we don't know what happened Mark do you think this is similar to like Having a fireball on ice, like the fireball, like the liquor on ice. I have had that. (laughs) It's good. Um, I I see the similarities. Maybe we could call that that drink the thing. I don't know, but... Okay, so Lisa is our mixologist on this podcast. And Lisa, like, you probably can refine this better than we can but yes let's let's figure it out it's a very simple drink it has ice (laughs) and fireball (laughs) that's it but what else can you add to it yeah thank you could be one that you like light on fire oh oh like the flamethrower or like dry ice because dry ice is like it burns and it's ice so yeah i don't think you're supposed to Touch dry ice. I think it burns. I know, I know, but dry ice is in some drinks. Let's do it. So, was Wilford Brimley bad the whole time, or do you think he somehow got infected at some point when the dog came in? Listen, I don't know, but I don't think he was bad the whole time because I trust this man and. I don't think he was bad the whole time because if he was, wouldn't have like stuff gone sour before this. I think you, you know, now, right now he's profiting off of, uh, elderly folks and their their diabetes. So, uh, (laughs) wait, is he still alive or is he deceased? Mark, you need to look it up right now because I don't even know. And PS like, him saying diabetes is life, and even my six-year-old knows him saying that. Mark, is he deceased? Tell me everything. From what I'm reading here, he is 85 years old. He's still alive. Okay, thank you. Wilford Brimley, we love you. And there's this, like, cat that, you know, in some meme... Um, they've done the audio over saying diabetes because it has like a, a similar mustache and I love it. So Wilford Brimley, you go, you guess, guess where he's from Florida, Salt Lake city, Utah. Oh, is he a Mormon? One could only assume (laughs) (laughs) a couple more fun, fun facts about Wilford Brimley. Uh, he was in the Marines, but then he worked as a bodyguard for Howard Hughes. He was a ranch hand, a wrangler, and a blacksmith. And he was sh- uh, shoeing horses for film and television in the 60s. 
Hey Rewinders, welcome to my spooky book corner and I am so excited to have you here but you know what I think my spooky book corner is pretty bright and sunshiny today. I love reading in the summer. How about you? I know some people like really get that reading vibe in the winter or on a rainy day when they can have a blankie on them but there's something about summer that just makes me want to read. I think because when I was a kid It was a time I could read what I wanted, not what we had to read for school. And so I have so many great memories of discovering Stephen King and Wuthering Heights and, oh my gosh, Anne Rule true crime books, anything and everything. And there's something too I love about sitting outside on a beautiful day reading. I've been doing that a lot lately. I got an umbrella for my deck um, to protect my pale skin so that I can read. So what did I read recently that I'm going to talk to you about? I actually just finished it uh, two days ago. It is a book called Catherine House. And I am so lucky I got my hot little hands on an ARC, which means a advanced reader copy. And um, I got to read this book that just came out a couple of weeks ago and uh, I feel very very lucky that I got to sort of read it right as it's coming into its own now there is a hashtag out there I wish I'd written it down but I um it it's promoting I'm gonna look it up while I'm talking to you it's promoting um making it so that black voices are being heard on um, the bestseller list, the New York Times bestseller list. And that, hold on, I'm looking on Twitter. Be patient with me. Um, that would work perfectly for this book. Okay, I'm looking up black hashtag. I swear this is riveting to listen to me do this. Black, but I want to make sure I do it right. Okay, I can't find it, but I will. I'll put it on my Twitter, and um, but anyway, it is a movement um, to make sure that the top books are voices of uh, people of color, specifically black people. And Elizabeth Thomas, the author of Catherine House, is a woman of color. Um, her main character is as well as well as um, a woman with you know a very fluid sexuality and that was really fun to read because I think like anyone I kind of get into ruts where I read a lot about white people by white people so I'm so glad I got the opportunity to read Catherine House but what really got me when I picked it up and um, got the chance to read the arc is it literally the first sentence in the book um, jacket says, oh, this book is in the spirit of Rebecca. And you know, I go on and on and on and on about how that's my favorite book. So I snatched it right up. Now, I definitely see, now that I've read the book, what they're talking about. First, Elizabeth Thomas has a very vivid, lush way of describing things. She's one of those authors that when she's talking about food, you start to salivate. And she just has a way of like transporting you to Catherine House that um, is very similar to the way that Daphne du Maurier can do it with Manderley. So what is Catherine House? Well, as usual, I'm not going to give too many spoilers away, especially as this is a brand new book and I want you to go out and even though I can't find the hashtag (laughs) um, because I suck at Twitter, I'm going to find it and tweet it out to you guys. But anyway, what is Catherine House without spoiling it? Catherine House is a very elite school and it's the kind of place where when once you go in, you don't get to leave. Room and board is paid for. Um, it's very difficult. It's very rigorous. But you also get to live in this like beautiful gothic Victorian type mansion so it's not so bad um but this is definitely a thriller horror book so obviously we know that it might seem okay at first but not so much what i loved about this story is that there's a mystery in inez that's the main character in her backstory 
And along with that, there's a mystery moving and propelling the story forward, which is my like favorite type of mystery is basically what is going on in this old, huge Catherine house. There are definitely secrets, gothic, dark corners, wallpaper peeling, strange shadows. I mean, all my favorite things. Now, it's a very character-driven book, which I very much like. But if you are the type of person who likes constant action, this book might fall flat for you. If you need like a lot of jump scares and gore and things like happening, happening, happening. This is a quieter book. It's beautifully written, but it is something that is definitely for someone who likes to get into characters' heads and appreciates the small hints of gothic and the small hints of horror. So, what else can I say about Catherine House without giving too much away? There's a great cast of characters. Um, Something that it says in in the ARCs book panel as well is that, you know, we don't have your typical final girl, um, virginal, perfect, white. She has, you know, a life that she's lived. Even though she's very young, she's been through stuff and she's not perfect and she makes poor decisions sometimes and um that's just my favorite thing I love complicated women as you know I harp on it all the time I'm just a broken record aren't I so here's what I suggest go out and buy Catherine House which by the way I'd like to add it has a little bit of a sci-fi tinge to it that's all I'm gonna say I'm not going to um elaborate anymore because I don't want you to um be spoiled But anyway, I want you to go out and buy Catherine House, and then I want you to use the hashtag that I can't find, but I'm going to (laughs) find, and I want you to flood that New York Times bestseller list with black voices. Um, Now is, you know, the time. So let's do it, and um, this is a good reminder that we need to read horror or anything by people of color as well as stories um, depicting them as well and I know that uh, I can do better with that so anyway um, I can hear my kids yelling in the next room so I have to go be mom now but uh, I really appreciate all you guys do for the reading and writing community and just keep reading okay and I'll see you in the horror book section bye mark We need to rank this movie on a scale of 0 to 10. 0 being you hated it. 10 being you think it's a perfect movie. What's our scale? I don't know. Maybe those blood... We didn't really talk about it, but those blood... That scene was pretty cool where they did the blood test where everyone was tied up and he did the... I don't even know what he did. He, like, got his thing all hot and he, like, put it in their blood. I don't know. He got his thing (laughs) hot. It was like, uh, you know... a. Uh, whatever but no it needs to be a flamethrower a flamethrower of it was like a poker basically of yeah testing their blood but i like the flamethrower okay flamethrower throwers zero to ten how many flamethrowers do you give the thing i gotta be honest this movie never like got me never oh it never really pulled me in it's very, I don't know what the right word is. It was like you're in the same place the whole time and never changed. There was no, you know, like a James Bond movie where you're in like Beijing and then you're in like the Swiss Alps and then you're in Mexico and then you're in London. You would prefer that versus this? Yeah, this movie, I didn't, I don't, I don't know. I didn't really en- enjoy like the setting. I didn't really get to know the characters very well. Um, I don't know. I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a three, three out of 10. I don't know. I just, it didn't, it didn't grab me. Wow. I, I, I'm sorry. I know. I see that it got good rotten tomatoes and all that, but I, I, I don't know. It wasn't for me. That's fair though. Cause we want your honesty. 
we don't want people to be like, mm, I saw the Rotten Tomatoes and all. Mm. No. Okay. So here's my review. I give it a six th- flamethrowers. And I know that it is a classic sci-fi horror movie and that's great. But you know how many women were in it? Zero. Yeah. Zero. And not that that needs to define any movie that I love. But at the same time, I'm just like, okay, you know, that's fine. I was going to ask you if it passed the Brechtel test or whatever it's called. Bechtel. <laughs> Bechtel, I'm sorry. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Mark's sleeping on the couch tonight. What is it again? Bechtel? Uh-huh. Sorry. Um, yeah, no no women. I don't know. I just, I don't know. I didn't get, I didn't really get a good feel for any of the characters Maybe except for Kurt Russell. I might give it a slight nod for the the ending where you just don't quite know what's happening. It's ambiguous. Kind of like Inception or like The Sopranos. So oh, might have to bump. I'm going to bump my score up to a, a four. Is it too late? No, it's still time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Listen, rewinders. We're, we are not perfect in our opinions. We are not perfect in any realm of life. But we watched The Thing on the anniversary of the rewatch or the release of The Thing. And this is what we are saying. So, you know what? Add us if you want to because we deserve it. Until next time, oh, we'll see you scrolling through the horror section. Bye.